This Rome Total War commentary video is one of the prizes offered for interesting play in the Quest for Elysium tournament that I, Clooney the Scourge, hosted on the 8th of February 2009. In this battle we see one of the contestants, Teruthin, playing as Thrace, and he took five units of archers with the gold weapon upgrade, four phalanx pikemen who form his front line, and he took a mobile arm of infantry composed of two bastani and four folksmen with very light upgrades only, and for his cavalry he took four gold gold upgraded Greek cavalry units. His opponent, General Chaos, played as the Senate, and he took two units of Roman archers with the gold weapon upgrade, six early legionary cohorts with four of them forming a front line, with two in the rear as reserve, one unit of war dogs in support, and for his cavalry, three units of legionary cavalry. So, General Chaos has much stronger cavalry. He also has disciplined legionary infantry and dogs available. Teruthin, on the other hand, has much better missile troops, though the heavy rain at work in this battle will reduce the usefulness of that. Also, his barbarian troops, the Bastani and Folksmen, will gain a combat bonus from fighting in the snow. Now. When the battle began, the two generals found that they had each deployed on different sides of the villa that forms the central feature of this battle map. Teruthin's Thracians could have circled clear around the villa to encourage the Senate to fight over on the far side, here, but instead they chose to meet the enemy here on this side, and I think that this was a good call by Teruthin. Here their flank on the left would be covered by the villa, and to the right would be covered by the forest, and both these present obstacles to the Romans using their superior cavalry in flanking moves. If they go around through the woods and meet Thracian infantry there, they would be at a disadvantage since cavalry suffer a penalty in woodland against infantry. Since the Thracians have a 5-2 to two advantage in archers, they don't even need to deploy them on loose formation. However, here we see Thrace make its first serious mistake. They send their archers too far ahead of the main army to begin the missile duel. So now they're vulnerable to enemy cavalry. On the other side of the villa we see General Chaos sending his archers forward. Oh no! I can't shoot through this solid stone wall! Nothing in my training has prepared me for this! We're all going to die! Now, I wonder what we can see peeping through these windows here. Any daughters of the house undressing, possibly? No. How disappointing. Oh well. So, the bowmen began exchanging fire, and sure enough, initially the massed missiles from the Thracians were drowning out those of the Senate. Uh, General Chaos attempted to drive back some of the Thracian archers by releasing his war dogs. Possibly he was hoping that if archers are set to skirmish mode, they will skirmish backward automatically in the face of dogs. In fact, they don't do that or possibly he was hoping that the Thracians would withdraw their archers to save them from the casualties inflicted by the dogs. One of the Senate archer units was wiped out to the last man, and the dogs were ineffective. Now, General Chaos has to do something, or else he faces Teruthin using his superior missile forces to compel him to attack Teruthin on his own terms. So, this is what he did. He launched a full attack with his cavalry against those exposed archers, and rushed all of his infantry forward to hold the attention of the Thracian infantry. These men of the Senate loved freedom better than their lives, and when the Tempest crashed around them, rose and stood and charged into the storm's black heart. And so we see that because of the error in the deployment of the archers, uh, General Chaos has now neutralized the missile advantage that Teruthin had over him. Perceiving that he's in danger of losing control of events, Teruthin decides to seize the initiative and sends his pikemen forward to fix the front line of the enemy legionary infantry in place. They promptly release all of their pillar and inflict serious casualties on the rightmost phalanx pikemen unit. This creates a weak point in the Thracian front line that the Senate will probably attempt to exploit in the future. At this point, in response to Chaos's cavalry sweeping out through the woods over to the Thracian right, three of the four Greek cavalry units are sent to intercept them. This is a mistake, there's no other way to describe it. For Greek cavalry, the lightest of light cavalry, to have an effect against heavy cavalry like legionary horsemen, they would need to attack in large numbers. 
and also ideally to achieve an envelopment. The result is predictable, the Thracian cavalry is destroyed. Now back over in the centre, as we see the infantry engaging, Teruthin attempts to make an outflanking move with one of his pikemen units. However, Chaos peels off one of the reserve legionary cohorts he had deployed to intercept them. General Chaos's choice of early legionary cohorts, rather than legionary cohorts or either of the two elite forms, means that his infantry power is somewhat less durable, but he can afford a greater number of units, meaning he can hold some in reserve, ready to intercept flanking movements by Thrace, while at the same time being able to afford expensive cavalry. In fact, this battle was characterised by both sides seeking containment of their flanks and rear, as you will witness. But first, here we see Teruthin's final Greek cavalry unit being pounced upon by the legionary cavalry and put to flight. This is significant, it means that General Chaos's Senate cavalry now have a free hand in the Thracian rear. You're going to witness this have a paralysing effect on Teruthin's Bastani and Foltzman, his mobile units most of which are left to linger in the rear of the Thracian army to protect the pikemen against rear charges, instead of being used in massed flanking. This Bastani unit harbouring the Thracian general, being one of the exceptions used to make a flanking attack on the Thracian left, and once again it was intercepted by one of the reserve units Chaos had deployed. These Bastani are tough soldiers, they get two hit points each, they have solid striking power to them, they're so tough that they get a bonus from fighting in snow when they aren't even wearing shirts. They may well be a match for an early legionary cohort, but you see what General Chaos does here. He manoeuvres his remaining Roman archer unit so that they can fire directly into the rear of the Bistani unit at point-blank range. I'll bet that stings. Now here you see the first examples of that paralysing effect I was talking about. The Thracian player, Teruthin, is unable to make proper use of units like these Bastani for fear of the legionary cavalry flailing around in his rear area. In the meantime, General Chaos can rely on the discipline of his Senate legions to hold out in a grind fest for as long as he needs to cause havoc with those stronger cavalry. He can also take advantage of that paralysis he has induced by making this flanking move over on the Senate left, the Thracian right, by hitting this phalanx pikeman in the rear, while a second cohort unit is intercepted by the Bastani you just saw. With pretty much nothing on in the way of clothes except a bloody big helmet, they look like some kind of crazy sexual fetishists from a sleazy European porn film. Now I don't know about you, but I find that pretty damned intimidating. Now here over on the left, things are beginning to look a little stronger for the Thracians. The Bastani are now supported by one unit of Folksmen, though these other two units are still left fallow, for fear of the cavalry in the rear. But now there are two units working away at this legionary cohort, and if the Thracians are going to get a breakthrough, it will be there. Back in the Thracian rear, we see more examples of that paralysis I was talking about, as those folksmen you just saw, a futilely attempting to chase the legionary cavalry back in the rear, who of course can maneuver and strike as they wish at will. And it's at this point that they do precisely this, destroying the Bistani unit on the Thracian right and beginning a series of routes that imperils that wing of the battle. With the benefit of hindsight, it seems that Thrace might have done better to take the risk by making a full-scale flanking move with all of the Bistani and Folksmen on one wing, perhaps the left nearest the villa, hoping to achieve a local victory so that forces could then be transferred to where they were needed next, even if it meant losing units over on the right. All is not yet lost for Teruthin's forces, however. He still has plenty of loyal standing units, folksmen, pikemen, all ready to give up their lives for the glory of Thrace. His position over on his left looks particularly strong, but it is now that the gods display whose side they favour, and it is Rome pouring all of their strength into a legionary's sword arm, who thinks it must have been the Weetabix he had for breakfast, they cut down the Thracian general at their strongest point. If I should die, think only this of me. There is a corner of some foreign field that is forever Thrace. The blow to morale caused by the death of the general finishes the Thracian army. Thirty battles were fought in this tournament between twelve contestants. Replays were sent to me to be studied. I chose two of them to make into videos, plus the final. This is the first of the three videos.